everyone. Welcome to the Granite Bay Hilltop Church Sabbath School Study Hour. I'm Pastor Rod Thompson. I'm going to be leading our study today. And I am so glad that you are joining us. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or you're uh, watching at home online in the local area, across the country or around the world, thank you for joining us. Before we get into our study, I'd like to uh, point you to the free offering that we have. It's this little pocketbook titled, From Stress to Joy. And you can get that by dialing the number 866-788-3966 and asking for offer number 705. If you're in the United States, you can also text to the number 40544, the code SH031, and we'd be happy to get that out to you. If you're outside of the United States and Canada, you can go on your computer and go up to the URL and type in study.aftv.org forward slash SH031, and you'll be able to download uh, that pocketbook for free. Well, family, uh, we are in our quarterly on Psalms, and today we are in lesson number six titled, I Will Arise. If you remember, uh, two weeks ago, we were in lesson number four, and we explored the idea that God is our shelter, God is our refuge, God is our strong tower, God is our strength. And these metaphors signify the Bible truth that God stands by our side, by the side of his faithful children, and he is there to help. And this week, we are going to look at a very similar figure of speech. We're going to look at God as a mighty warrior who is fighting for his children. Brothers and sisters, have you ever noticed that God's timing is always perfect? God is never early and God is never late. But if your walk is like mine, you've probably discovered that sometimes God takes longer than we wish he would. Sometimes God stretches us right to the very limit. I've had many times in my own walk with the Lord where he has taken me right to the very edge. And Lord, something has to happen now or else we're in trouble and God always comes through. God tell, uh, Peter tells us that God is long suffering and is not willing that any should perish. And even though God's timing and his intervention isn't always coinciding with human expectations, the day of his judgment has come. Did you catch that? The day of his judgment has come. That's what it tells us in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. And, and, and through this statement, we know, don't we, that we are living in this anti typical day of atonement. In Revelation 14, verse 7, it says, that uh, the, the day of his judgment has come. And we see uh, through prophecy, through uh, the Bible, that that began in 1844. And that judgment has been going on ever since. And so we can say that the judgment has come, but we could also say that a day of judgment is coming. Because at some point, uh, they are going to get to you and judge you and your record of your life that is recorded there in heaven. And I believe very soon that that judgment is going to end and Jesus will arise. 
He will stand up and He will be coming to this earth for judgment. I'd like you to notice Psalm 96 verse 13. It says, For He is coming, for He is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with His truth. It says something very similar in Psalm 98 verse 9. It says, For He is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness He shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. We, we see here in these Psalms that God is going to judge the world. His judgments are righteous and we can count on that. When what that means then is that up until he does come we need to be learning to trust him and in his promises. That he is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do. And we need to trust in him until that day when Jesus comes. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there are at least 50 promises in the book of Psalms. There's probably more than that. That's, that's how many that I have seen. And I want to share uh, just a few of those promises with you. Notice in Psalm 1 verse 3, it says, Those who walk with God will produce fruit in the right season. They will always be in blossom and always prosper. I like that verse because it's a promise of God that if we surrender to Him, if we walk with Him, remember Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. We have to be connected to Him. And if we are connected and if we walk with Him, He says there will be fruit. And we would expect that if we're walking with God, that that would be good fruit, wouldn't it? Notice Psalm 3, verse 3. It promises that God is the one who lifts up our heads. You know, if you're like me, sometimes I do things to bring shame to myself or perhaps to others, and I have to hang my head. But we have this promise that if we humble ourselves, that God will lift us up. Psalm 3 verse 5 promises that God will give us rest. We have uh, that promise in several places in the Bible. Jesus said, all of you who are uh, weary, all of you who are struggling, come to me and I will give you rest. Notice in Psalm, chap uh, Psalm 4, in verse 1, it says, relief when in distress. God promises he'll bring that relief. Verse 3, he promises to hear us when we call. Isn't that a comfortable feeling to know that when we're calling upon God, that it's not just being lost somewhere out there in space, but God hears our prayers. He hears our call. Verse 8, he promises peace when we sleep, and he promises safety. In Psalm 10, verse 17, he promises to hear our desires and will strengthen our heart. Every day, my wife and I pray together. And every morning, I claim that promise. Jesus said, if you remain connected to me, I will give you the desires of your heart. You know, when I gave my heart to the Lord, my children were teenagers. And things changed drastically for me and for them. And uh, all four of my children had a drug problem. Yeah, my wife and I, we drug them to church every single week. And they were at that point in their life where this was such a dramatic change for them and they didn't know God like I did. They hated it. And, and so they couldn't get moved out of my house fast enough. 
But my wife and I pray every day. And every day I claim that promise. Lord, you promised that if we remain connected to you, you will give us the desires of our heart. And my desire is for my family to know you, to be known by you, and to have eternal life. And Lord, I know that that's your desire too. You've told us you're not willing that any should perish. You want them in heaven. And so if your desire and my desire lines up, Lord, I'm not asking you to take away their free will. I know that they are in the world. I know that they're slaves to sin and addiction. I know that they may have turned their back on you. But Lord, I'm asking you to intervene in their lives. Lord, bring some worker in their life that they will listen to. They won't listen to me, but maybe they'll listen to someone else. Bring that person into their life. Lord, bring angels to minister to them. And Lord, I pray that you would bring the circumstances that are necessary to bring them to a place where they recognize the depth of their depravity. They see their need for a Savior. And Lord, when you get them to that place, help them to choose you and choose life. And so I love that promise of God that he will give us our heart's desire. And if we are walking with God, our desires should be lined up with his. And that's why he can confidently say, I'll give you the desires of your heart. I want you to notice Psalm 18. Verse 1 says that he promises to give us strength. In in verse 2, it says, God is your rescuing king. That's a, a great promise. Verse 17, he will rescue you from your strong enemy. We all have a strong enemy who's trying to destroy us, who wants to, to pull us away from God, wants us to distract us. And God promises that he is able to rescue us from our strong enemy. Verse 18 says that he provides support and is our light in darkness. Family, have you noticed that this world is getting darker and darker and darker? And God promises that he is going to be our light. He is going to be a a light unto our path. He's going to uh, help us to get through the difficulties and the challenges that we face. Verse 30 says that he promises to be a shield. And verse 32 says that he will equip us with strength. And, And friends, there are so many more promises. Those are just a few. But let me give you another one. God promises that he is just and he is righteous. I want you to notice Psalm 16, verse 5. It says, Lord, you give me stability and prosperity. You make my future secure. You know, Jesus made it pretty clear to us that without him, we can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible. And with the Lord, we can have stability, we can have prosperity, we can have a future. And God has promised those who love him an incredible future. Isn't that a wonderful promise that God loves us? And that he is going to provide for us. I want you to notice that in the Psalms we discover that there are two aspects of God's divine judgment. We see that God promises deliverance for those who are oppressed, for those who love him, for those who have surrendered to him. But he also promises destruction of the wicked. And you can be certain that what God has promised will come to be. We just need to remember 
that it will be in God's timing, not in ours. I'd like you to take your Bibles and and open them up and, and join me in Psalm 7. Psalm 7. And I want you to notice, starting in verse 6, what it says. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. Rise up for me to the judgment you have commanded. And so the congregation of the people shall surround you. For their sakes, therefore, return on high. The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord. According to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous, God tests the hearts and minds. My defense is of God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword, he bends his bow, and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out, and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High." Family, there is some awesome information here that we're reading in those texts. I I, I want you to notice that it tells us here in Psalm 7 in verse 6 that for the Christian, for someone who has surrendered their heart to Jesus, someone who has that living connection with him, the judgment is a good thing. And the psalmist says, lift yourself up. In other words, arise, O Lord, because of the rage of my enemies. Rise up for me to the judgment. He even goes on to say, judge me. And so for the Christian, the judgment is a good thing. But then in verse 9, we see that wickedness will come to an end. And so it can be a very fearful thing to undergo the judgments of God if you are not surrendered to Him. I want you to notice that the psalmist is telling us that God will arise. He will judge. His judgments are just and they are righteous, and the wicked will come to an end. It even told us there that God tests the righteous. He allows things to come into our lives to test our faith, to uh, make our faith stronger. And all of this is in God's timing. I don't know about you, but these, this passage here, especially in verse 9, it reminds me of uh, the complaint of Habakkuk to God. I want you to notice Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Habakkuk says, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless. And justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Family, do you ever feel 
like Habakkuk? You you ever cry out, Lord, how long? We we see the world getting darker and darker and and we see sin becoming more and more prevalent. And and we we have a a tendency to, to cry out and say, Lord, how long? Are you going to allow this to go on? The violence that's all around me. You show me iniquity. You know, brothers and sisters, God never intended for man to know evil. He only ever wanted us to know good. But when sin came into our world, then violence and iniquity and and plundering and strife and contention, all of these came as a result. And he says, therefore, the law is powerless. I, I, I love the way David says, Lord, I love your law. It is the meditation of my heart all day long. But the law is powerless to save us. All the law can do is point out sin, but it can't do anything to help us in sin. That's why we need Jesus. And he says, for the wicked surround the righteous, and their judgments are perverse. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that the psalmists are protesting against human indifference and injustice? They they have a refusal to accept evil. And they are motivated not by a desire for vengeance, not for a desire for revenge, but they are zealous for the glory of God. Therefore, it is fitting that the righteous should rejoice at the judgments of God. When they see God's vengeance being poured out on evil, because in this way, God's name And his justice will be restored in the world. You know, there are many people who want vengeance. But the psalmists all leave that vengeance to God. I want you to notice Psalm 58, verse 10 and 11. It says, the righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. That's talking about the vengeance of God. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges the earth. Here we see that the, that the psalmist is telling us that, that if, if we have put on Christ, if we have the righteousness of God, then we don't have to be afraid of the judgments of God and we should rejoice in them because we know that God is ultimately going to do away with evil. I don't know about you, but I long for that day when we no longer will have the propensity to sin, when we will no longer have the temptation, when evil will be done away with and there will be joy and peace. You see, the psalmist obliges people to raise their voices against evil and to seek God's coming kingdom in all of its fullness. In the Psalms, we are given assurance of divine comfort and deliverance. God will arise. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 18. Psalm 18, and I'm going to start reading in verse 3. 
The psalm of David here says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surround me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol, or the grave, surround me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coal of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils, he sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hate me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my support. I, I, I love how in this psalm that, that David starts out praising God, thanking Him that He uh, delivers him. And then we see there in verses 13 through 15 what the answer to his prayer was. That the Lord thundered from heaven. That the Most High uttered His voice. There were hailstones and coals of fire. He sent arrows. He scattered the foe. There was lightnings. He vanquished them. He rebuked them at the blast of the breath of His nostrils. And He delivered me from my enemy. From this language we should be able to see that God fights on our behalf, that He is able to defeat evil, that He will ultimately triumph over our enemies. I don't know about you, but I really appreciated our study this week on Sunday when it got into this uh, study a little bit on David. I think that we would all agree that David was a warrior. David was a type of Christ. And, and David, uh, being a warrior, David fought many battles. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, you have the story of David and Goliath. And I want you to notice what David says to King Saul in verse 34, David said to King Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. David was a, a, a young boy at this time, and, and no one's willing to fight Goliath, and, and David says, I'll fight him. And Saul says, no, you can't do it. You're a little boy. You've never seen battle. You've never seen a war. And David says, no, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I, I've seen lots of battles. I've had to fight the lions and the bears. I've had to protect my father's sheep. 
Notice in Psalm 18, verse 34, David says, He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. I want you to notice here that David is not taking credit for victory. But rather, he is saying that he is able to achieve victory because God is with him. He always uh, shows that God is the one who brings victory. God is the one who provides. God is the one who brings success. It's always God who delivers and sustains and provides for. And, and although uh, David states that God taught his hand to make war, nowhere in Scripture do we see that David relied upon his own skills for victory. I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to think about how David reached down into the stream. He picked up those small stones. He put one of them in the, in the pouch of his sling. He went running at Goliath. Goliath was coming at him. And, and while he's running, he's sl swinging and he slings that stone and hits him perfectly between the eye. Can you imagine the amount of skill talent, ability that that must have taken. And surely David had practiced many, uh, many hours, many days to be able to have that kind of ability and to be able to do that while on a dead run. But notice Psalm 18, verse 47 and 48. David says, it is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Here we see that, that David's not relying on his own power, his own skills, and he's not taking credit for, for being able to do anything that he had done. He's giving all of the credit to God. God is the mighty warrior. God is the one who fights on my behalf, David says. Psalm 144, verse 10 and 11. The one who gives salvation to kings, who delivers David his servant from the deadly sword. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners, whose mouth speaks lying words, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. Praise and prayer were always the sources of David's strength. And you know, it can be our source of strength also. God alone is to be trusted. God alone is to be worshipped. Well, you know, we also see in the Psalms that God shows special care and concern for those who are vulnerable. For those who are poor and needy and oppressed, the fatherless, the widows, the strangers. You remember in Exodus chapter 22 that God made special provision for those who were helpless. Notice Psalm 22, verse 21 and 22. God says, through Moses to the people, you shall neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. That passage there reminds me of the story of Ruth. You remember Ruth that she came uh, with Naomi to Israel she was a stranger in the land. 
But God had made provision that when you had land and you were harvesting, that you were not to harvest to, to, to get every piece of grain, but you were to leave a little bit along the edges. When the reapers were uh, uh, going through and they, they missed a little bit, there was, there was a provision there for, for those who were in great need, those who were the stranger in the land, to be able to go and to uh, provide for themselves. And we see that even though Ruth was a a stranger in the land, God provided for her. You know, there are many psalms that use the term poor and needy to describe the oppressed. Notice Psalm 40, verse 17. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my helper and my deliverer. I don't know about you, but I'm very grateful for that verse because I, I'm poor and I'm, I'm in great need of, of God. Psalm 12, verse 5 says, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. Here we see that God telling us that he will arise and he will uh, be a warrior in our behalf. Psalm 41, verse 1 and 2 says, Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. I want you to think about that for a moment, because here we are being told that as we consider helping others, as we reach out to those who are less fortunate than we are, as we provide for them in any way that we can. It says that that not only that, that that will be a blessing to them, but it will be a blessing to us as well because God will deliver us in our time of trouble. What a great promise from God. Proverbs 29 verse 7 says, The righteous considers the cause of the poor but the wi- but the wicked does not understand such knowledge proverbs 22 verse 22 and 23 do not rob the poor because he's poor nor oppress the afflicted at the gate for the lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul of those who plunder them. The the, the needy, the poor, the oppressed, those who are in great need, they have a special place in God's heart. And he says, I will defend them. And we don't want to be on the wrong side of that, do we? We see that evil done against the vulnerable were particularly heinous sins in the sight of God. Psalm 94, verse 16 and 17 says, Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would soon have settled in the silence. I could just add on there, the silence of the grave. The psalmist here is saying, Without God... Surely I would have died, but he was there. He rose up and he helped me. I want you to notice Psalm 9, verse 18 and 19. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Here we have that promise of God. You know, I think about the promise of Jesus. 
Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. I don't know about you, but that one, I struggle with that. Because I look at the things that are happening in the world today, and I see how uh, a wickedness is becoming more and more sort of in your face. We see uh, how this controversy has been going on for, for 6,000 years, and, and, and we see how, how we're, we're seeing uh, sin being played out right before us. And uh, we might have the tendency to cry out to God and, and say, you said the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against your church, but it sure seems like it is. But here we see that ultimately God will prevail. The expression poor and needy in the Psalms is not limited to material poverty. It, it also signifies uh, vulnerability, helplessness, and also pertains to sincerity, truthfulness, and love for God. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit. Family, I don't know about you, but I am desperately poor in spirit. We need the Spirit of God in us. And I need more of the Holy Spirit in my life. And you know, in His humility, Jesus identified himself with the poor by becoming poor. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus' riches include deliverance from every oppression brought about by sin. And he promises eternal life in his kingdom. And in the Psalms, he is described as a righteous judge who will judge those who mistreat. God had intended that he would be the king of Israel. And that's the way that it was supposed to be. He set up judges initially so that they could maintain justice in the world. But the intention was that he would be their king. And they decided they, they wanted a, a king like every other nation. And and. So there were no longer judges, but, but even when there were judges, they oftentimes were corrupt. And so in Psalm 82, verse 2, God asks Israel the question, and brothers and sisters, you and I are spiritual Israel, so he's asking us this question also. How long? Will you judge unjustly, God says, and show partiality to the wicked? They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. That passage reminds me of when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he cried out, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Isn't that what verse 5 says? They do not know, nor do they understand. And he says, they walk in darkness. And why do they walk in darkness? 
Notice Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God asks Israel, he asks us the question, how long will you judge unjustly? And then he goes on to, to say what we should be doing. But, but notice they were walking in darkness. And why? Because they had abandoned God's law. They had abandoned the Word of God. They were chasing after idols. And family, we have the same problem today. The majority of the Christian world wants to abandon the commandments of God. They say you don't have to keep the commandments. And so they have no light to walk by. And so what does God tell us to do? Psalm 82, verse 3 and 4. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. You know, the psalmists often uh, took right and wrong more seriously than everyone else around them in the land. They cried out to God to take vengeance on their enemies, whether they were individuals or, or nations, but nowhere in the Psalms do any of the psalmists ask if they can be the agent of vengeance. There's only one place in Scripture that I can think of off the top of my head where, where someone asks to be the agent of vengeance, and that was Samson. As his eyes had been uh, destroyed and he's, he's being uh, persecuted by the Philistines and he's standing there, he says, essentially, God, give me the strength and allow me to avenge my eyes. That's basically what he says but nowhere in the psalms nowhere else in scripture do we see people asking to be the agent of vengeance that's why i really struggle with uh, people who say well the bible says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth so i'm going to get even a lot of people say that but family, that is a slaughtering of the text. All of Scripture must come into agreement. And if, and if that's advocating vengeance, if that's advocating uh, for me to get even with my enemies, then why does Jesus say, uh, blessed are you when they persecute you for my name's sake? And uh, why is it that Jesus said, if someone strikes you on the left cheek, give them the right also? Or if someone takes your sweatshirt, give them your coat also? Or if someone wants you to walk one mile with them, walk with them too? What do we do with that verse where Jesus said, vengeance is mine? So clearly, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth can't mean that you have the right to take vengeance. But rather, we have to rethink that verse and we have to realize that that's not talking about vengeance at all. It's talking about equality. Well, let me give you an example of that. Let's say that you have a tree that needs to be cut down, but you don't have a chainsaw. And so you go over to your neighbor and he's got a, a Husqvarna Rancher 55. He's got a professional level chainsaw. And you borrow that chainsaw and you're working and something happens and you break that chainsaw to a point that it cannot be fixed. Well, 
An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth means that if you borrowed your neighbor's chainsaw and you broke it, you owe your neighbor a chainsaw of equal equality. You can't then go out and buy a, uh, a McCullough beaver with a, with a little tiny blade and uh, uh, take it over to your neighbor and say, hey man, I'm sorry I broke your saw, but here's a replacement. It doesn't compare. It's not equal. It has to be of, of equal value. And so it's not talking about vengeance at all. We are to allow God to be the agent of vengeance, not us. I want you to notice Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. Vengeance is mine and recompense, God says. For the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants. We have to leave the vengeance to God because God's retribution is measured out with a balance between justice and mercy. And we are called to pray for those who mistreat us and offend us. We are called to be a blessing even to our enemies. Notice Matthew chapter 5 in that Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, starting in verse 43, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Brothers and sisters, it is the devil who uses force and coercion, but God uses love to fight injustice. I don't know about you, but... I've discovered that it's a lot easier for me to love those who are lovely. It's a lot easier for me to love someone who's kind to me, who's helpful to me, someone who makes it easy for me. But I've found that it can be very difficult to love those who are harsh, those who are hard, those who are difficult. But God has called us to be a blessing to them. And God is going to judge it all. And so I'm glad that I don't have to be the one to judge the world. Because in my judgments, I often make mistakes. But God never makes mistakes. God judges righteously. And God's justice is balanced with justice and mercy. And do you realize, family, that God's justice is closely related to the sanctuary? The earthly sanctuary services of ancient Israel were patterns and, and shadows pointing to greater realities. And there were two ministries in that sanctuary. There was the daily and the yearly. And in the daily, all of the sins of the people were piling up in the sanctuary. And so in the yearly, there had to be a, a cleansing of the sanctuary. And uh, you don't have a complete cleansing of God's people you don't completely do away uh, with the sin problem without the sanctuary and so the psalmist understood that it was in the sanctuary where the problem of sin was dealt with notice Psalm 73 verse 17 the psalmist says it wasn't until I went into the sanctuary of God then I understood the end of the wicked when, when we when we look at the sanctuary service and, and we see that that God ultimately will win that sin ultimately will be dealt with, then we can put our trust in God. Notice Psalm 77, verse uh, 13. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. 
In other words, family, if we're truly going to understand the plan of salvation, if we're going to truly understand how ultimately it's going to end, we need to understand the sanctuary and the symbology and the greater realities that it was pointing to. Well, family, there's so much more that we could talk about, but we are out of time. And so uh, before we close in prayer, I just want to remind you of our free offering for today, this little pocketbook titled From Stress to Joy. And you can get that once again by calling the number 866-788-3966 and asking for offer number 705. If you're in the United States, you can text the code SH031 to the number 40544. And if you're outside of the United States, you can go on your computer and type in the URL study.aftv.org forward slash SH031. And you can get that digital download. Well, family, let's uh, close our time today with prayer. Loving Father, what a blessing to... Uh, study the book of Psalms to see that you are a warrior who is fighting on behalf of your people. And Lord, there may be times where it looks like the devil is winning. There may be times where we, like Habakkuk, might question, Lord, how long are you going to allow this? But Lord, we ultimately know that in the end, you will destroy sin and sinners. And Lord, we want to be a part of that group who in the end can stand on the sea of glass and say, heaven was cheap enough. And Lord, we pray that as we go forward that you not only give us this insight, but Lord, that you act on our behalf and that Lord, you will save us from our sin, from temptation, Lord, even from ourselves. And we pray and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen and be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want and most important, to share it with others.